For a lot of gay men, being a drag queen is like being a comic book superhero. Sooner or later, Clark Kent has to tell Lois Lane that he puts on a cape and a fierce pair of red boots to tear it up in Metropolis. Today, we take a look at the trouble gay guys face when telling someone they're dating that they're a drag queen. Joining us is the she Larius San Francisco drag queen Peaches Christ, who somehow managed to break the news to her boyfriend that she does drag, and he didn't run away in terror. Plus, does Sister Dick make you sick? Ten reasons not to date a drag queen. Who gets to use the walk-in closet? And how to rope your boyfriend into running your merch table. I'm Fausto Fernos. I'm Mark Fillion. And this is Feast of Fun. Attention all non-basic queens. Attention all non-basic queens. Show how fierce and fabulous you are with our drag queen inspired t-shirts. Reading is fundamental. Hunty. The shade is strong with this one. And Shantae. Fabulous fashion for guys and gals with charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. Available at feastoffun.com slash store. Hello. Hi, is this Peaches Christ? <laughs> this is her. How are you, darling? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing pretty good. We're still a little hungover from the Super Bowl, from staying up late and recording a podcast afterwards and examining the nuances of Lady Gaga's performance. I'm a Satanist. <laughs> so people are saying it was satanic. Well, they were kind of hoping that there would be some kind of satanic ritual. The, the alt-right was saying that there was going to be something in there. But I didn't see anything too satanic in there. But they did have a five-second delay, so maybe she did do a Hail Satan and we didn't even see it. Maybe, yeah. Um, she said afterwards, can I get a Hail Satan up in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and everyone's like, huh? What? I thought this was sponsored by Budweiser. <laughs> Who's being bored? Did you guys him. actually watch the um, the sports? I watched some of it. Yeah, I watched a little bit of it just before the halftime, and then I watched towards the end because I was just like, "Holy shit!" The Patriots really came back. I thought for sure they were going to lose, but it's always you know I could look at Tom Brady all day, even though he's a I guess a Trump supporter. It's like that guy you hooked up with. You went home from the club. And you had this great sex with him. And then afterwards, he turns on the lights and it's like a pit picture of Hitler's on his wall. And you're like, <laughs> I got to get out of here. <sighs> yeah, I guess uh, when you're caught up in the moment, you're, you, you know, gays, gays overlook a lot mm. because of, uh, you know, being perverts. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Hey, let me ask you uh, this real quick, because I saw something on Facebook. and I remember you guys talking about this years ago. Somebody was ripping down posters from like the drag queens in town. I don't know if it was your posters God, or Heckelina's yes. posters or it was uh, everybody's posters and like taking them down. And it was like this real life. What the <laughs> fuck is going on? <laughs> and then I see on Facebook, there's like this short video of this guy going over, uh, ripping a poster Somebody's filming it. It seems like he gets caught in the act and he just tears it up and throws it into the air and then walks away. What the fuck is going on? Well, for years and years, there have been different people um, on and off who who take it upon themselves to be the neighborhood um, like cleanup crew when it comes to um, ripping down event posters and, you know, um, outdoor marketing. So I noticed in San Francisco that you guys do a lot of outdoor marketing, a lot of posters on the street. And we, I guess we do that inside kind of in different coffee shops and stuff. But in San Francisco, it really seems like that's the way to get the word out about shows. It's very European. Like if you go to Paris, you know, there's these little cylindrical yeah. uh, stumps where people put their posters mm -hmm. up. And it's sort of like, right. I don't know how good a, a marketing that is because there's so many posters. Everything kind of gets lost in that crowd, right? Well, uh, and in San Francisco, it's a little bit different. Uh, you know, Seattle has a rich culture of this as well, where outdoor marketing and street pole advertising, they're kind of part of the culture of the city. In San Francisco and in Seattle, it's really only specific neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, where, where it's permitted. Legally, it is permitted in, in the Castro, in the Haight-Ashbury district, in the Mission. And, you know, there are... Um, 
what's the word, I guess rules, you know, um, sort of uh, guidelines that you have to go by the size of the poster and putting the date on the poster and where it's posted. But if you follow the city guidelines, you uh, should be able to keep your poster up for a certain amount of time. It's usually like one to three days and then they'll, they'll take it down mm-hmm. and then people put them up again. And it actually is a really effective way to remind folks about what's going on, what's happening. It's also really a way to be sure that people who have less money for marketing and advertising, people who are doing community events, people who are starting out their career as a, an event promoter, you know, that there is still a way to get your message out versus paying for expensive advertising or whatever. Mm-hmm. Is that what you did in your early days of drag was just like, you know, making a yeah. photo poster? Because there was all this great art made in the 1980s, um, which is when you got started, right? Uh, well, I was in the 90s. Are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> nice try, bitch. <laughs> so, so there's all this great art made because people didn't have a lot of money, so they had to rely on their imagination. And so, like, there were photocopy stores called Kinko's. Where people would, you know, uh, photocopy stuff that they found on the library and make these beautiful, beautiful posters, uh, black and white posters on colored paper. Mm. My graphic designer for the early Midnight Mass years, it was all cut and paste. It was all old school zine comic book style. And we would take these boards to Kinko's and and make the um, artwork. They weren't digital. We weren't using Photoshop or anything like that for a few years. And we posted them on polls and stuff. Uh, I rely a little less on that kind of marketing these days as we've grown up, but I really fight for everyone's right to use that that sort of urban style of getting the word out of sharing community events and mm-hmm. marketing. And I'm glad that San Francisco and the supervisors have you know maintained our right to market that way. And what has happened over the years is every couple years. There's some nasty curmudgeon who moves to, uh, you know, to the neighborhood and takes it upon themselves to become what we call the poster Nazi and, uh, you know, tear down everyone's posters and throw them in the trash. And, you know, there have been two different notorious people that we've battled, you know, on the streets, Mm -hmm. um, legally. I mean, it's amazing that it never really got violent or turned more heated because, these guys are messing with people's livelihoods and they're dealing with, you know, drag queens and event promoters who are, you know, dramatic, emotional people. So um, it never really did, but they, they were people that we battled legally and, and always, you know, we won um, in, in the long run. But, you know, a lot of it was uh, such a pain in the ass. What do you mean by you battled, you battled these people legally? You took them to court? Well, we would call the police because I mean, technically what they're doing it was uh, break, uh, breaking the law, tearing it down because we had the legal right to post them. And so if you think about it, I think a lot of people just dismiss it as like, yeah, well, who cares? You know, it's trash anyway. It's like, no, we are paying someone to create this artwork. Then we're paying to print it. Then we're either walking around and taping it up ourselves or paying someone to do that. It's, you know, we are working within the law mm-hmm. and this is part of living in San Francisco. And if you don't like it, move to the fucking suburbs, you know, mm. where it's illegal to post on, you know, street poles or whatever. And so it has become a cultural battle in a lot of ways amongst people who want to see the neighborhood clean and the people who want to continue to see it as a a vital place providing entertainment and nightlife you know i was going to tell you that's this story about the early days of me posting midnight mass flyers when i was posting a a a poster with the uh actress and actress in quotes uh chesty morgan and her humongous gigantic tits where she used her tits to crush men's heads and like, you know, (laughs) battle them and stuff. And so I was posting this poster for her movie, double agent 73 and, uh, and this queen. And when we were at a kind of crowded intersection and this older queen and by queen, I just mean gay guy looked at me and was like, I have been meaning to tell you how much I hate your garbage. And I, I kind of looked at him like, <gasps> uh. and um, this other queen who was just as old turned to him and was like, 
Oh, shut up. I remember you fucking in the streets in the 70s. How dare you tell these young people they can't have fun now that you're old and have your house on the hill. Fuck off. And the whole, like, corner cheered for that guy. They were going to, like, yeah. <laughs> Bravo. You know, and it was, and, it was it, and for me, it was really empowering as a young queer who, you know, had moved here and, you know, was easily rattled by, you know, an older person yelling at me or chastising me. And now I find myself in the position to go out and defend the rights of these people posting posters. And so what happened the other day was Heclina had been sent a video of this loony guy walking around and ripping up posters and actually just throwing them on the street, which was very unusual because usually the whole, you know, argument is that I'm cleaning up the neighborhood of your garbage. Mm -hmm. Um, But this kid who was actually young, usually the, the, the the typical profile for a poster Nazi in San Francisco <laughs> is certainly it's certainly um, white Caucasian gay male over the age of I would say sixty um, mm. very uptight hasn't you know been fucked in a long time uh, and probably <laughs> a little you know suffering from you know some sort of um, I don't know uh, maybe maybe sometimes. Uh, Drug or alcohol addiction, mm. um, power issues, whereas, control issues. Yeah, there's definitely because when when you start to like really interface with them, you're like, eh, this person's not all there. You know, they scream at the police. They'll scream at anyone. You know. Um, so this kid that was doing it, um, mm. it ended up being a new kind of uh, poster thing. And what we found out later, after you know, sh- kind of blasting him on. Um, social media uh was that he it was it was actually specific it was actually that he was flirting with a guy putting up posters and the guy didn't reciprocate (laughs) what (laughs) so this queen yeah like that was what that was about but you know we didn't know i mean we're so we're so damaged from years of having these battles that we just thought oh my god we've got another poster nazi on our hands so what's up with this new poster nazi that you guys have caught on film this guy that hecklina had a video from was apparently the story goes because he was completely like identified and then publicly you know shamed and what he said was that he had been flirting with this guy who was putting up posters and the guy was rude to him. And so, and you know, which would actually explain why he just threw the posters on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, he was upset or angry that, that his, um, uh, you know, affection wasn't reciprocated. And so he was ripping up the posters. So anyways, Hecklina actually took the video down and, uh, you know, apparently he's promised, not to tear tear down posters anymore. Oh, okay, because I went looking for it last night. I was just like, where'd it go? I'm like, oh, something must have come of this now that it's missing. So the video was somebody who was really angry and they were like pulling down every poster. It was, it was from across the street. You know, okay. he's kind of like a hipster looking kid with like a scarf and a hat and like a coat. And he's just seeing like he pulls the poster off and then like rips it in half nonchalant, like and then like, carefully throws it into the air. Like, huh, what are you going to do about now, it? Now, I, I believe, you know, that, that the... <laughs> That people who are in alternative culture, you know, the underground, the alternative do have a right to uh, express themselves and 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 ha- make sure that their message doesn't get co-opted into, uh, you know, modern uh, fascist movements. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, seriously, like in my day, uh, we used to put up posters and I actually have. Gretchen Phillips of Two Nice Girls Mm -hmm. tearing down one of my posters to put up one of hers. And she she was shady. She she was being interviewed, right? And so she's just like, talk. uh, I guess it was for some documentary on lesbian musicians and Mm -hmm. stuff. And literally, it's a poster of one of my drag shows with my face on it. And she's just like, not looking. And she's just like, taking it down and putting up her poster. And that made it into wow. the doc. And it made it into the documentary because she's doing it very subtly, you know? Mm-hmm. But I'm like, I knew for a fact that when that was filmed, my show still hadn't finished its run. 
Uh, and I was like, you me, shady lady. That is a declaration of war. <laughs> <laughs> Faust is a lover, though. He's not a fighter. Gretchen came on the podcast. She, we, we're friends. You know. I, and I don't think she meant it maliciously. She was just like caught up in what she was saying. She was self-involved. Yeah. You know, and so she, she was publicly shamed. Do you have video of that? Uh, it's it's in this documentary that was uh, being passed around. It's still there. Like it's it's it got it, it made you it to take the final out that cut. One clip, <laughs> like just just isolate that one little clip and just share it and say, "Look at Gretchen so and so taking down my poster <laughs> and replacing it with her own." It doesn't seem very fair. Well, we used to get the the center on Halstead, which is our community center here in town. We used to put cards down there for the podcast in the early days. And, you know, because, you know, we're a community resource. Uh, you, you can everybody at this table agrees to that, you know. And so I would put them out there and the uh, somebody there and I understood it was the director would throw them out. And so now they keep sending me press releases and stuff. And so I keep unsubscribing to their newsletter. <laughs> Because I'm just like, well, listen, you throw fair. my stuff out. If I hang a poster, you throw it out. I don't have to take your stupid newsletter. Right. So exactly. I hope, I hope somebody at the center is listening to that. In San Francisco, I have to say, like, it's incredibly respectful. Like, even if you don't like other people's events or you don't like the person or whatever, it's very, very rare that anyone is ever busted taking down other people's stuff. There's mm -hmm. like this sort of respect that everyone shares as far right. as that stuff goes because if you are that person who practices that way the whole rest of the community will just ice you out mm. um as far as and and we all need each other event promoters and drag performers it's like yeah there's competition but like that's just playing dirty are you mm. saying that love trumps hate <laughs> <laughs> yes i am you know in respect and um Ethics, you know, they go a long way. Well, sure. today's show is getting ready for Valentine's Day, which uh, is a really difficult holiday for a lot of people who um, are unconventional in some way or another. And I can't think of an artist or performer that's more non-conforming than a gender non-conforming performer. <laughs> and drag queens usually find a lot of challenges when it comes to dating other people. If they're on Drag Race and they're famous and everyone wants their attention, like Alaska Thunderfuck sings in the song Race Chaser, mm -hmm. it's sort of hard to trust, to not, to not, don't, don't trust necessarily the affections of your fans because they might just be treating you like uh, you're a fetish to them you're you a trading know. card yeah. yeah and conversely like if you're somebody who's just getting started and you're a drag queen there's always the question that comes mm -hmm. in a relationship when do you tell that other guy that you're dating, this is for, you know, mm -hmm. cisgendered gay men, that you're also a drag queen? Mm -hmm. Also, too, Foss is soft peddling this a little bit because my initial reaction for the show is just like I see all these Facebook posts on these on drag queens, you know, saying I, I, I know I'm trying to date this guy, but he doesn't want to date me because I'm a drag queen. And so everybody chimes in like he's a jerk, da, 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 that kind of thing. So initially, my response is like, let's compose a list of all the reasons why you shouldn't date a drag queen, because maybe you fall into into this. This, uh, to this line and you and Fausto are both like oh my god that's a terrible idea it sounds mean but the list is kind of funny <laughs> well I said that I wanted to be on the side of all the reasons you should hate a drag queen mm -hmm. I think it's funny because I actually think Mark you're actually being what's the word you're, you've like progressed beyond the notion that 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 drag queen that not dating a drag queen is, you know, kind of a popular sentiment amongst gay men. Mm -hmm. But it is, and unfortunately, a lot of gay men still, like, are threatened by the idea of it. So when we do this show, and we go over all the reasons we, we you know, think it's a bad idea to date a drag queen, I hope the listener realizes the only reason we're comfortable discussing this this way in a comedic podcast is because we assume that you aren't self-hating assholes. Right. Exactly. This is right? for the cool <laughs> kids. And, you this know, is for the and cool we'll, kids only. Yeah. Right. And we'll learn we'll learn some valuable lessons today, just like on uh, a fat Albert. <laughs> <laughs> except, without, <laughs> except without Bill Cosby. Yeah, minus Bill maybe, Cosby. Maybe maybe Mark's mind will be opened. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, I think so. Well, listen, uh, the number one reason, and we did a whole podcast on this about before uh, with uh, you with you about this is one of the reasons <laughs> you shouldn't date a drag queen is the smell because sometimes they're stinky. <laughs> it's their clothes are stinky, and then they try and cover with Febreze or they put on makeup. They have weird moisturizer. They smell like an old lady's makeup box. So you know we're turned on by scent, and sometimes that scent can be just like destroyed. I don't want to have sex with my grandma. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I, I actually think that our podcast has done a lot of good mm -hmm. because since that podcast has mm -hmm. come out, I have noticed mm -hmm. that drag queens, um, they still smell, that's true, but not as bad as they used to. Yeah, it's gotten better. But I also think, too, it's like, improved. you know, because when did Febreze really come out like 10 years ago or something uh, like that? I, I give there was Peaches credit for that yeah. one. And in part of it is that Peaches made chewing gum on film and drag a popular thing to do. So the breaths don't <laughs> smell as well. And the movie Milk, <laughs> and the uh, mm -hmm. Oscar award winning movie Milk is Peaches Christ, somehow a time traveling drag queen, manages to find herself in the 1970s chewing gum in the middle of a Harvey Milk rally. I don't know how it happened, mm -hmm. but it happened. They had gum in the 70s. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Peaches Christ in the 1970s. <laughs> I was playing a character. I think I was you're, a, you're a, like a, you're a time lord. <laughs> yeah, so it's funny, though, is I mean, actually, there's two Peaches um, uh, movies from the 70s. One is Milk, and uh, you, you at home can see if you can find me in the movie Milk. And then the other is a movie called Diary of a Teenage Girl. And I'm in that movie as well as Peaches, which also takes place in the 70s. But I'll tell you this. Hmm. I was not chewing gum in Diary of a Teenage Girl. I took it out. I remembered. <laughs> I think that like the I gum. Never hear the end you of know, this. honestly, like I think the gum chewing was brilliant because mm -hmm. it really it was a subtle enough gesture that made you stand out mm -hmm. a, above the crowd. My favorite part about right. it was was uh, having Cleve Jones on this podcast talking about how tacky it was for you to chew gum in a, in a <laughs> film about milk. <laughs> yeah, you were goading him. Here you have an opportunity to interview a historical figure and yeah. the gay, you know, civic uh, civil rights movement. The, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. Human rights movement. It's all piece of fun like, for you a reason. Talk, you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not well, called um, Feast of I'll AIDS talk, Quilt. Yeah, Feast of Responsibility <laughs> doesn't do so well. No, but I mean, Cleve's yeah. a, a, an amazing person. And you know what? He's 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 a, he's a very funny person himself. He's very funny and very charming and very engaging. So, well, so number two reason. All the drag queens at home, a, a warning about that. If you are going to chew gum, and it's a great idea for keeping and maintaining fresh breath, um, <laughs> just be careful because certain drag queens, when you add that element to your look, um, it could really confuse the audience. For example, if you are Heclina or Alaska, you know, people will just think you're the black stallion or sea biscuit. Um, <laughs> Showing so the cud, right? You need, yeah, you need to be careful. Well, I was reprimanded by saying that Heclina was chewing cud and my own mother who has to chime in on every Facebook post I share was like, uh, for your information, Sea Biscuit is a horse, and Hecklina uh, isn't chewing cud. She should be chewing hay because cud is for cows. <laughs> I said, "Well, she's both. <laughs> she's a cow horse." <laughs> <laughs> so number two reason if you oh date a drag God. queen and you get involved and you move in together, the bitch is gonna take over your closet. Eventually, it's just gonna True. spread, and you have I nothing can't deny left. It. Well, uh, Peaches, you I'm and your boyfriend to live together, of right? We do, yeah. And 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 do you guys split the closet evenly, or how does that work? Um, so we have we have our boy wardrobe, um, and that is split evenly. And then there's another closet that's actually the closet in the apartment, and that is for all my um, peaches to go drag. Mm -hmm. And what that means is I keep a, a certain amount of to go drag here at home, a certain amount of wigs. And basically sequin gowns so that I always have a look ready to go should I get that phone call at the 11th hour, um, and which has happened. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have time to, uh, to pack um, uh, from my storage unit. Um, so, so 
the reality for us though is luckily we have a whole I have a whole storage unit um that that most all of my drag lives in but I don't um suspect that uh, all drag queens or even most drag queens you know um have their own storage unit and so it is true if you date a drag queen you are going to have considerably less closet space if you get into an argument with your boyfriend do you say Listen, I'm going to put you in the storage unit and pull my drag into my home. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's a problem if you get to that that place because you know, then then you're talking about committing a felony. Number 3, glitter everywhere. It'll never come off of you anywhere. It'll be on your face, it'll be on your clothes, it'll be on your floor, it'll be in your bathroom. It's very true. Can't deny it. I'm mm. trying I'm sorry, queens out there. I'm trying to defend you, but that this is undeniable. And when I first started dating my partner, Nihat, I remember being kind of horrified by the fact that, like, every day it looked like his face was full of glitter. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't even, like, look, like, like using this glitter. And I'm like, oh, my God, well, it's undeniable. It must just be in our apartment, in the air. You know, it must be just floating through the air at all times because I would spot it on him and I and I didn't say anything. And then after a few weeks, it was so crazy to me that he had glitter on his face all the time that finally I was like, I don't know what's happening. Like, you have glitter on your face all the time. Well, come to find out, you know, he was he's an immigrant and he uh, was working at this is before he had his papers. He was working at a like a T-shirt shop sort of under the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's touristy t-shirt shop and they were they sold these san francisco t-shirts that were covered in cheap gl- glitter you know with glue on them oh. and so the glitter was coming from folding those t-shirts not from me now the glitter's coming from inside the house <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah but i was really relieved believe it or not it caused me a lot of stress and anxiety no i was like i i just think you know even if you just hang out with me glitter mm. just appears on you when I was working in a bar once, I had a I had glitter on me, and a, a female customer was just like, "Did you go see strippers last night?" Because when my boyfriend goes see strippers, he always comes home with glitter on him. And I, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, "No." So if you're like a closeted gay and you're dating a drag queen and you have glitter, you can tell the people, "Oh, it must be from that stripper I saw last night." Although one time, right, mm-hmm. I hooked up with a guy who's this cute little dancer. And I, I was done having sex with him, and I'm looking at his face, and he was, had all this glitter on his face. So I looked at him, and I was like, you're a Broadway dancer. And he's like, the devil told you that. <laughs> you can tell by their legs. They're slutty antics. <laughs> well, and it was also the glitter. The glitter mm-hmm. gave him away. And, mm-hmm. and that's the thing about it is, is like, glitter is the marketing tool of an entertainer. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this, uh, this information applies for people who are actors or uh, burlesque dancers or drag queens, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, and part of it is like, I wanted to sort of attract uh, people who are to listen to this podcast to how to rope your boyfriend into I'm not done with my list. Wait, yet. wait, but I want to, cause we were talking <laughs> about stuff here. Okay. How do you rope your boyfriend into get him to buy your expensive shoes and wigs? Okay. And at peaches, how, how does that work? <laughs> I have not figured that out yet, mm-hmm. to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, because I know that really... Willem, Willem Bellide uh, f- brags about that. And I don't know if he still does, but it's well, like. He's got, a, you know, he's got a, a hooker kind of uh, sensibility. sensibility about yeah. him. So, and, you know, if he does or he doesn't, it, but it's also it's, it's good for humor, you know, because who doesn't want to be a sassy woman who has uh, men just like buying them lavish gifts. And, you know, about the notorious fight between me, me, I'm first and Shangela. Where oh. Mimi uh, accused Shangela of, of turning tricks, oh. of having sugar daddy, and Shangela's like, I earn my own money and I, earn, I buy my own stuff. <laughs> I don't need no damn man. And then they started throwing drinks mm-hmm. at each other, and that's why RuPaul's she- Drag Race doesn't allow the girls to drink more than one alcoholic beverage in their break. Two. Or two. Mm-hmm. But she, what I liked is because she asked herself a question, she asked the a question, and then she answered it, which I actually really love that moment where she goes, because I am what? Sickening. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she doesn't like, have a sugar daddy. Oh my response. god, that was a great moment. That's mm-hmm. great. That's great television. Mm-hmm. No one can deny that. My For god, sure. I really miss that. Those backstage 
shenanigans. Mm. I'd yeah, say it seems back, very tamer. Uh, let by, them in, go at each other, you know? It's a lot tamer by comparison, right, today, you know? I think so. I mean, in some ways, I actually really enjoy the new, um, what do they call it, the secondary show? Untucked. Um, Untucked, yes. Um, yeah, I really enjoy this sort of... Um, gritty realness of it, you know, mm-hmm. because you're like, oh, wow, they kind of just are in this warehouse behind that wall is the other side of the set, you know. Um, so you, you, you get more of a sense of it being realistic, but there was something fun about the phony interior delusions lounge and all of that. <laughs> like, you know, it was like, yeah, we all know it's fake mm-hmm. and it's part of the show, but it was, it was just a great mm-hmm. extra content. And also I felt like it was where you kind of saw the girls, um, let their hair down a little bit more as far as revealing their personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, but still, you know, they were in, in more of a pressure cooker. You know, they were still having to be on for the cameras. So another thing about dating a drag queen is basically you're standing next to this fierce human being and you're going to be re- uh, relegated to the role of toady or henchman and being handed a camera saying, will you take our picture, please? And, just, and not That's even being treated true. like a human being. <laughs> That's true. If you've ever seen that documentary, Guest of Cindy Sherman, just replace mm-hmm. Cindy Sherman's name with whoever your drag queen boyfriend is because <laughs> <laughs> that'll be you. So how how do you what 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 what's Well, one of the hardest things about it is that? is also if you're a successful drag queen mm-hmm. and you're dating somebody, in order for them to like even hang out with you, and this is a boyfriend, mm-hmm. they have to wait in line for the meet and greet. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. No. <laughs> That's not true. No, I've, you I've do seen that happen. That is, yeah, it, mm-hmm. they were like, I I stood in this line for an hour mm-hmm. because I need the keys in order to get back into the apartment. Well, I did ask <laughs> I, 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 did, I did ask Ginger Minch's boyfriend about like what's the worst thing about dating a drag queen that's famous. You know what I mean? And he said the thing is is like that you you miss her because she's out of town a lot. Aww. And I was just like, oh, I wanted something really. That, <laughs> I wanted that's something very more cutter. True. Yeah, and that's no, that's it, probably mm-hmm. the that's probably the honest. Mm-hmm. biggest challenge for us for sure the, and, and all of these things have a good side and a bad side right mm-hmm. so like the, the the key is to to my mind is if you are dating um a successful drag queen and you understand what their job is and what what is what is you know performing you know um on and off stage because see a lot of people don't realize that like those meet and greets that time that we're spending out amongst, you know, an audience or fans or at a after party, we're still performing. And in ma- many ways, it, it's just as hard, if not harder, than the stuff we're doing on stage, which is actually quite often the most mm-hmm. fun part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's nice when your partner really gets that, like, oh, they're still exhausted. Their feet hurt. I'm going to see if they need any water. I'm not going to mind or be a pill about being asked to take a photo because I'm actually just helping make their life easier. Mm. Um, but I've seen it go both ways, you know? And then the other thing too, is, is it's like, if that sort of stuff bothers you, don't go visit your boyfriend at work, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because that's what it is. It's work. And I, and I, I, I know it's creative, it's artistic, it's fun. It's, but, but you know, it's also, it's a job. And mm. so when people forget that it's a job, you know, I've seen boyfriends, get jealous of their partners for doing their job, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, So it's a tough, you know, you have to be really kind of secure Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And humble. And not just, and humble, Mm -hmm. and not just to date drag queens, but I think any successful entertainer, politician, anyone in the public eye like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and so makeup hides more than just gender. Often I see this a lot that uh, drag queens hide their drug and alcohol dependency behind a wig and a crap ton of makeup because, hey, it's their job to be drunk in a bar for some of them. Um, I think that one's a little reaching. Is it? Well, I don't think the makeup <laughs> hides it very well. What'd you say? <laughs> 
just sitting here thinking like, well, well I don't know. Because I kind of think of it like, because, you know, I, these, it's kind of like I think about these types of drag queens. Now, not, of course, not all drag queens are like this, but I think of them as a, like the Cubs fans or people that are uh, sports fans that put on the jerseys and then go to the field. It's like, yes, they love baseball, but what they love more is drinking at the baseball game. And so they hide like their, their drug or alcohol dependency behind their love of baseball and being at the thing. Whereas, you know, they're, they're literally like uh-huh. stumbling out of the stadium, like wasted. And it's like, you right, know, right. but the they excuse it is, because yeah. they're a Cubs fan. Right. And the same thing could be said of like rock and roll fans mm-hmm. or, you know, rock and roll musicians, yeah. punk rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess. Right. I guess there is this sort of like greater acceptance. Whereas if you were, you know, um, an accountant going into work drunk, you know, you'd probably get fired. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you're <laughs> yeah. right. I, I can see that. I it's, see your point now. I thought you meant yeah. more like beware because they're actually drunk and you don't know it. It's like, no, everyone knows, you know. <laughs> you know, and it's like, and that's part of it. Like you say, a lot of these are commonalities with other you know, other types of performers. So, and then one other thing too, uh, you have to watch out for when you are uh, dating a drag queen is you have to talking them talking them off the drag race bridge. Uh, for most of them, it's going to be an eventual disappointment and hand holding you'll have to do when they don't get cast on Drag Race. Oh, uh, right, right, right. I guess that's a that's a newer problem that I didn't struggle with growing up because there was no Drag Race in my uh, my formative years. Mm-hmm. But I would assume, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's sort of like I, I feel like for young queens now, it's hard not to see Drag Race as the pinnacle, you know, the the thing that everyone's trying to achieve, you know, just to get on the show. You know, we didn't have anything like that. So, yeah, that's an interesting, it's a new new thing, huh? I, I'm sure, you know, I bet there are young queens, though, who have not pursued it. I don't know. I, I, I guess most are pursuing it. Mm. it. The young queens, the old queens. I mean, Charlie Hyde's going to be on the season. Is the oldest drag queen yet to be on uh, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race? We w- watched the um, Meet the Queens videos mm-hmm. the other day, and I was like, "That one is supposed to be like fifty something years old, but she mm-hmm. looks amazing." She does look amazing. I, there's a there's a I, I'm guessing a fair amount of snatching going on, and then also too, half her face is hidden by. A I think mask. half her face is snatched; the other half is. Behind a mask, but who but knows? You know, even still, mm-hmm. even still, you know, like yeah, just, you're right. Mm-hmm. It, undeniably, she doesn't mm-hmm. look bizarre. She just looks really gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know, you know, whatever her secrets are, go girl. Well, I, I think uh, you know, with Charlie Hyde's and with these queens who are getting on Drag Race, part of it is like. They want to get on Drag Race because it un- it's kind of like a video game. It unlocks all these bonus mm-hmm. rounds. But when they actually get on Drag Race, then they have like a publicist intentionally keeping them out of the press in order to make sure that the top three or the top five get more press mm-hmm. attention. And so the qu- the smart queens go- kind of sneak in and get their little mm-hmm. goodies, get on Cooking with Drag Queens and other stuff, unbeknownst to the publicists, right? And then the, the, the queens that are not so good at it, they follow the rules. And then when everything is done and mm-hmm. said and done, they're like, why does nobody book me anymore? And I'm like, well, they're not booking you because you followed the rules. Because ultimately, drag is about breaking the rules. Mm-hmm. And, and the queens who, you know, carve their own path are the ones who are going to be the most successful. Mm-hmm. Ultimately. Like Katya wasn't supposed to do those video blogs, but she did it anyway. She and did it And then she anyways. became like, you know, a, a the number international one. superstar for sure. And she was not supposed to be Katya Zamolochikova. Remember when she did her Rewind or whatever it was? Not Rewind. It was the... uh, Her video blog, she was not supposed to do that. She was not supposed to go on Feast of Fun. She was not supposed to do Cooking with Drag Queens. She was not supposed to do a lot of things that she did. And she did them anyways because she loves drag. Mm -hmm. And she's an independent, free-thinking rebel. Mm -hmm. And um, And and they're not going to sue you. And they're not going to sue you. (laughs) But anyways. Anyways. The ultimately the the most dangerous thing about dating a drag queen mm-hmm. is that you're going to become a drag queen yourself. While sister dick won't make you sick, drag is contagious, or you just simply become a drag queen by osmosis. Eventually, you just 
you know, you're putting on makeup and then the lipstick kind of accidentally, mm-hmm. you know, stains you or when you kiss them, mm-hmm. the lipstick gets on their lips. And then it's suddenly like, hey, you know what? I do look good in a mm-hmm. pair of heels yeah. and pumps and then some fake titties and a wig. And it totally challenges your conservative notions of gender and sexuality. Uh, OK. OK. <laughs> I think this happens. <laughs> Some of the time. Oh, she, but the, not Peaches is like <laughs> not having it. So I see her like she's scratching the ground with her feet, like ready to punch us or something. Okay, what's going on, girl? <laughs> no, no, no. What, what no. are you, what are mean, you feeling? Okay. What are you feeling? It is true mm-hmm. for you guys. That is the case. Don't forget, you guys are in an inner drag relationship. Fausto was a drag queen, I believe, before you guys started dating. I, I actually dressed in drag long before Fausto ever did. Oh, it was so a fraternity know. drag. Whoa. Doesn't count. Just so you know, in it high does school, not I, dra- I, I dressed in drag as drag and a freshman in high school, and also as a C and a senior in high school as well. So there's that for like for like gimmicky things or because listen, you were I looked beautiful. <laughs> And people, everybody said that I had natural grace and charm as a as a drag queen. Um, let's. Yeah. But just, what was it for? Halloween. <laughs> it was a it was a photo. Like yeah. it, Mark's wearing it's a wig. I went to Ca- I went to Catholic high school and I spent a day in drag. Yeah, that doesn't count. Yeah, and I oh. got that you were not owning it, mm-hmm. but you were. You know, in on the joke with all the straight guys, like, look at me, ha ha. I was dressed. I'm as, dressed in women's clothes. Uh, yeah, but all this, the uh, all the straight guys were all like over the top characters, where I was uh, demure and pretty. I'll send you a photo. Well, here's the thing. I've seen the photo. You guys both do drag, and you know, there you go. So, mm-hmm. so, so, my point is, some relationships, I have definitely seen what you're describing mm-hmm. for sure. But then I've also seen plenty uh, where that doesn't happen. Like, I I don't know. I just, I can't picture Nihat ever doing drag. Nihat, do you want to do drag? No, he doesn't want to. Is he there in the room with you? He's in the other room. Put him on the phone for a second. (laughs) (laughs) They want to talk to you. He's not going to. He said no. <laughs> come He's on. like, come on, Nihat. Give the people what they want. He won't. See, Nihat, see, this is the thing He's about terrifying. Nihat, probably why it works really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And no, it's not that he just has no interest. He's, you know, the, he realizes, like, I. he asked me, what are you doing today? Because he doesn't go into work till later. And I said, I have, I have this to do. I have a meeting. I have a podcast. So for him, I'm just sitting over here doing work, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but he's not. he's not engaged or interested in that way, you know. Well, if Nihat uh, and you guys are a couple, you share and understand each other and appreciate the things that each other do. And so, you know, sometimes couples compliment each other as opposed to mirror each other. But isn't there a tiny little bit inside Nihat and curiosity that when you put on your costume and become Peaches Christ, that the public reaction is so intense that he doesn't want to experience just a fraction of that for himself? As a curiosity, as a person? I don't think so. Honestly, I think for him, if I can speak for him, mm-hmm. uh, he does really enjoy being an audience member. Like, he loves to come to the shows. He gives me his honest feedback. He is a fan of the people I work with, sometimes a little too much. You know what I mean? Like, if I have to hear you know him talk about how fucking great Jinx is, you know, for another minute, um, you know, I might just put a bullet in my head. Well, he Jinx really is delusional. So talented, um, but he really, really enjoys um, what I do. But when I've asked him, "Do you want to get involved? Do you want to help out? Do you want?" He has no interest, mm. none. Um, yes. and I actually really respect that, and mm-hmm. I think in some ways it's really good. It, it's a very you know, and when he gives me his feedback, um, I I really appreciate it. It's truly constructive, you know. Um, and and I know of similar relationships. I mean, I don't want to talk about other people's private mm-hmm. lives, but you know, I think Coco Peru and her husband have a very similar dynamic. And and you know, um, there's a few. Uh, it uh, can couples. Yeah. But I think that, you know that that uh, isn't just unique to us. Um, where where the partner admires it, respects it, um, is a fan of it, but doesn't want to be involved in it. Mm. 
Well, uh, part of it is, is it that maybe just a tiny little bit, you kind of want to have that something special and unique to you. So sort of define yourself as an individual in, and mm-hmm. you know, cause relationships, there's a lot of loss of, of individuality when you marry someone. Yes. I think that's very, very true. Mm-hmm. I think what that, that is, is Nihat recognizes that peaches is an extension and creation of Joshua. And I think he is, uh, yes, he enjoys that this is something I've created. And I think he um, admires it in a very sweet and loving way. Mm -hmm. And he also gets really kind of a little defensive of it. Like sometimes I'll ask him for, you know, business advice and he'll be the first to be like, no, that's not a good enough deal for you. You you shouldn't take it. Don't take that offer. You need more money or more respect or more control or whatever. You know, he's that kind of voice sometimes for me. Have you been, like, have you don't you, need that. Don't do that. Were you able to rope you know? him into working your merch table? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's never done that. I mean, probably if I were in a bind, um, you know, and needed something, um, he would jump in. And he certainly jumped in when I'm like, oh, my God, I left such and such at home. Can mm-hmm. you, you know, mail it to me or this or that, you know, the normal thing. Do you have any fi- uh, final words of advice for uh, drag queens looking for love uh, and what they can do to find a man and keep <laughs> a man? <laughs> um, yes, I think um, my best advice is to recognize that your job is no more important than their job. And your passion and your drive is no more interesting or special than their drive. Um, but you don't, you know, don't under, don't sell yourself short, you know, be a hundred percent confident about who you are, what you do and what you are and give uh, the same respect um, that you give your partner, um, ask for that re- respect in return. I think equity um, regardless of who the two people are, but the most important thing is that you value each other um, equally and that you uh, both complement one another. And that with the big, big, big stuff in life that you're on the same page. And then from there, I think, you know, you can make it work. Mm. Um, you know, so I think, I think I've seen drag queens get into relationships where they, what's the word? Um, settle, I guess, settle because, oh, why would anyone date a freak like me? And so they're kind of be like really great, wonderful people. I've seen friends of mine who, you know, are with people where you're like, that person is a fucking asshole. And you get the sense like that they don't think they deserve better or that they're going to find better. Um, I think that's a problem. And then I've also seen, you know, problems where the drag queen hasn't quite uh, adjusted her own ego or sense of grandeur and is, you know, queen of the universe. Um, and so, you know, that, that doesn't work for too long. You know, I, 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 eventually, you know, people get tired of you um, believing this fantasy, you know, that is a fantasy. So a little vulnerability and humility can go a long way, not only into improving your interpersonal relationships, but your romantic ones as well. Yeah, for sure. But I think it's really great that, um, generationally, you know, we, we started this show with that caveat of like, Hey listener, we understand what we're about to talk to, to talk about is sort of a problematic on a surface level because drag queens are often dismissed and overlooked by, um, the, the mainstream gay community as being clowns we love. Mm-hmm. Um, but as partners, you know, they're really, you know, dismissed or trivialized or seen as gross or icky or, you know, there's still so much, self hate in the gay community when it comes to, um, you know, masculinity and femininity. And Mm -hmm. sadly, I don't think, um, we've evolved, um, to the point where, you know, we're beyond these issues. However, um, I do think we are evolving and I certainly see it with like young people, especially Mm -hmm. don't really give a shit anymore. You know, a lot of them, you know what I mean? Like they can be, I mean, I, I see like, masculine, feminine, non-binary, every spectrum, gender, you know, um, uh, a lineup with whoever, you know, two fems, one masculine, one fem, whatever. People Don't forget all over Coco Peru's ma- two-spirit. <laughs> the two-spirit. Uh, but uh, seriously. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, a lot of the drag queen hating thing is a type of misogyny. So gay men really need to look at how they treat drag queens and then think about, do I treat women like this? Um, a lot of gay men don't make that connection. Like I posted something recently where it was like, uh, you know, people were gays were celebrating this, this idea that Trump had backed off some anti LGBT executive order. Mm-hmm. And I was just so infuriated by it because I'm like, it's all a ruse. You know, if, if you don't, if you don't support the women's march and women's rights mm-hmm. and a women's right to choo- a woman's right to choose, or you know, mm-hmm. it, if you For are sure. not feminine right. and you are a gay male, you are defeating yourself. You know, homophobia is nothing more than you know a weapon of sexism. And if and if you don't support immigrants and you don't you know see that intersectionality is the key, then um, you're full of shit. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're not supporting queer rights. I really just don't believe that anymore. And then people, you know, kind of wanted to argue with me about it. And I'm like, eh, we'll never stop kind of educating each mm-hmm. other. I hope that I'm open to people's ideas and challenges. But to me anymore, it's like I'm so tired of privileged gay men who don't get out there when they can't see the direct benefit to themselves. For sure. You and know, that's part of the reason why point. they held back gay rights and LGBT rights for so long is they actually knew that, you know, we're very radical. And we knew once we got our rights, even though a lot of us in, uh, have been working f- for women's rights and immigrants rights all along, that once we have like marriage equality and don't ask, don't tell, we're going to look for other things to fight for. And that's why they held us back because they're like, if they're busy fighting for this, they won't be busy fighting for that. But now we are busy for fighting. We are busy fighting for that. Don't you feel like Right now, we are at this sort of like rock bottom moment, like in this surreal nightmare that we're all living in. And like that that one of the silver linings or maybe like glimmers of hope might Mm -hmm. be that we all see the common enemy Mm -hmm. and these movements that are so important and powerful, like the Women's March, which was just so incredible and and um, pride mm-hmm. and LGBT queer rights and Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. and immigrant rights and um, farm workers rights and just everything, you know. Peaches, you sound like a Bernie or bust. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I, I, I'm very I'm very hopeful that that this rock bottom moment <laughs> is going to, yeah, maybe shake things up. I mean, it's mm-hmm. the only thing we have, right? I mean, of it course, is. I didn't. I mean, I didn't, I'm not one of those idiots that felt like we could, um, what's the word, sort of dismiss this whole election and not vote for the um, lesser of two evils kind of thing. It's like, at what cost did people like Susan Sarandon think Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, that this was worth it? I'm not one of those people who, who felt like it was okay to allow this to happen by far. But I am, as you know... I don't tend to be cynical and I like to be optimistic and I am motivated by action. So, okay, well, here it is. This is what we have. And so my hope is, oh my God, something's got to come from this. Something decent has to be on the other side. You're doing a show soon with Bob, the drag queen called legally black. (laughs) Yes. What's the premise? Well, the, the premise is, you know, obviously it's a, uh, drag queen parody of the movie Legally Blonde that we're doing um, in San Francisco before a screening of the movie Legally Blonde. And um, when I first talked to Bob about it, uh, I said, "Oh yeah, let's let's you know let's cast you in the Reese Witherspoon role, and you know it'll be as if a black drag queen, you know, were dating a rich white guy um, and followed him to Harvard, and we can call it Legally Bob." And uh, and Bob was like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Like, I like that movie. I really like the musical. And, uh, okay, you know, we were talking about different different ideas. And then he said, I think we should call the show Legally Black. When I said, oh, God, that's kind of, like, pretty in your face. And um, and ultimately, I guess you're right. Like, that's what it, what it would be. That's what the show would be. Um, and Bob was like, well, now, you know, now more than ever, you know, who gives a shit, you know, let's just do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I thought, well, I think he's right. Cause the question of, you know, like the, this, this show is not going to be designed to challenge the audience. It's going to be, of course, a celebration of, of hopefully like 
uh, a sentiment of inclusivity and to celebrate, you know, the underdog winning, you know, mm-hmm. but instead of it being a blonde, um, what would you call her? A valley girl, I guess, a blonde, you know, California girl uh, making it at Harvard. It'll be, you know, from the point of view of a black drag queen. Um, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> Well, and also I think what's really great about your productions is that you always play to the strengths and the core values of each entertainer entertainer you work with, right? For sure. And Bob is certainly, I mean, one of the things I admire so, so much about Bob is just how unapologetically outspoken he is and how smart he is. It's funny. I call, I call Bob he, I, I always do that. Like the drag queens with the, the male names, mm-hmm. I gender them he, but Bob is a she. I keep forgetting. Bob the drag queen is a she. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and Bob is somebody who, you know, is very much a part of our community and somebody who for a long time was uh, a regular on this podcast. And, and, uh, oh, well, I was first introduced to Bob yeah. for your podcast and then cast her in um, a show in New York City we did before she was on Drag Race. As, so this, we've actually worked as what? together. As, as what? As, you can't. Jackie Olasis. <laughs> Jackie Molasses? <laughs> yeah. Instead of Jackie Onassis yeah. for Return to Grey Gardens, it was Jackie Molasses. <laughs> How did that work out? <laughs> but it was originally written for a white person, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, first Lady Bear played her. Oh, yeah. Different people have played the character. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, it was Bob uh, in New York. And I really, you know, Bob was my first choice. And, and that was from discovering her on your podcast. You know, I hadn't um, seen her perform. Mm-hmm. So I just fell in love with her, listening to her talk on your podcast. Uh, same thing, a lot of drag queens you've interviewed. I really love Joan Waters. I really mm-hmm. love um, Lucy Stool. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've been introduced to, you know, Drag Race isn't the only um, channel to discover drag talent. I love that Feast of Fun introduces people to queens who haven't been on the TV show. I think the Dracula, um, the Dracula web series has done a great job of that. I think Hey mm-hmm. Queen has love done it. a great You know, I think for drag fans... You know, that drag race um, doesn't have to be, uh, obviously, drag race is so huge and it's so successful and you get more eyes than you than ever before. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for those of us who really want to get to know more queens a year than the the 13 that are on that show, um, you know, shows like yours have done a great, great service. And you've been doing it for so long. You know, I've been I've been on your show since before drag race started. Wow, has it been that long? And people were like, you're uh, insane to put Peaches Christ on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, well, you need to stop listening. You need to stop listening to Hecklina. I told you that. <laughs> it was Hecklina who actually said that. But no, uh, seriously, like uh, for for most of our popular guests that we've had on the past 13 years, um, when we first started having them on the show, inevitably there was a very vocal minority who was like, angry that we would focus on drag queens or focus on Brian Sweeney or focus Mm -hmm. on this comedian or another. But then inevitably it's like our core value is to talk to artists making culture and the culture itself. Mm -hmm. And because Feast of Fun ultimately is a show about art and, and that's what attracts us to you is, is our shared experiences, but also that you make really interesting work. Well, thank you. Mm. And anybody who gets a chance to see it, to see Peaches Christ's production, it really, it I can't describe anything like it. It's it's one, it's as as I, I'm surprised that you can get the tickets as cheap as you, they can because it's like it's it's worth the like if you paid a hundred dollars to go to Disneyland for a day, it's as good and as life changing and as exciting as going to Disneyland for the first time. Thank you. And, you know, it's been really satisfying to get to bring these shows down on the road in their truest um, form. Like we've been able to not have to water them down and we've set up a deal with Seattle and Portland where we now take the shows on the road and we're adding Los Angeles this year. Um, So that's really exciting. And it was just announced um, today, pretty, pretty wide that um, the drag queens of comedy is going to be coming to uh, Chicago Yay. as well as New York City, Los Angeles, what? San Francisco. So, so I'm really excited because with the Drag Queens of Comedy Tour, I'm going to get to come to Chicago. And while I'm there, I'll hopefully um, check out a few venues because I would love to bring a Peaches show to Chicago someday. 
Oh, it'd be so much uh, fun. Can you make sure you uh, get an extra day so you can do cooking with drag queens? Ooh. And do your peach oh, that's pie a good crust? Idea. Maybe I can. Uh, we fly from. I know that we do Chicago one night and New York the next night, which is actually really good because it means I could probably come in early to Chicago. So let's. Um, we'll follow up on that. Peach pie crust with peaches <laughs> crust. Peaches, thank you so much for talking to us. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was great. Bye, darling. Bye, you guys. Talk Unpleasant to you later. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> oh, wrong guest. <laughs> Bye. Peaches Christ lives in San Francisco, California. Check out her amazing productions. Legally Black with Bob mm-hmm. the Drag Queen coming soon. Peacheschrist.com. Mm-hmm. She's always such a fantastic guest. She's so much fun. So what are your thoughts on uh, being married to a drag queen? I learned that you have to keep an open mind and a warm heart. And you know, one thing that, that wasn't brought up what? is that when you date a drag queen, mm-hmm. it's kind of like dating twins. Uh, You're dating two people. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I want to remind the folks that we can't do this podcast without your support. So if you're not a Plus member, sign up today. Or if you're a Plus member, make sure your subscription is up to date. Go into your PayPal account and look for your recurring payments. And if it's not showing up, it's not coming through. And uh, if we dip below a certain below, it's uh, a number of subscriptions. It's curtains for Feast of Fun. Or if you'd like to make a donation, you can do that at feastoffun.com slash donate. Because your contribution to the show is what makes this show happen. If you want to access Feast of Fun ad-free, become a Plus subscriber at feastoffun.com slash plus. And we have fabulous t-shirts, tote bags, mugs, and lots of hunty-licious merchandise at feastoffun.com slash store. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I'm Fausto Fernos. I'm Mark Fillion. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.